Welcome to The Record Show, your virtual spin around the vinyl industry. Brought to you by Radio Wasteland Records. Yes, Midland has a record store. Here's your host, Jim Gleason. Greetings from the Wasteland and welcome to another edition of The Record Show. We've got a fun one headed your way today. We'll be asking your advice on what you think we should do with what very well might be a sealed and rare original blues album. But first, I'd like to welcome back to The Record Show, Ken Norton, after his RSD hiatus. Anything but a vacation, wasn't it, Ken? (laughs) It was awfully busy, but in a good way. You guys had a good record store day on your end at Ingram? We sure did. Uh, Ingram is continuing to grow. We have new customers all the time, and uh, we sold as much uh, Record Store Day product as we ever had. Good. Uh, And there's no rest for you either, is there? Because right on the heels of that, you're getting ready for the June drop. We do have another big batch of titles for June. So it's not as much as April, but uh, there's some big titles in there. So it should do really well again. That's kind of what I was wondering. I mean, I know that April was meant to be the record store day and June was kind of the fail safe because of the problems that the industry is going through as far as getting stuff printed or pressed rather. So, and I know right up until the week of record store day, a couple of weeks back, there were still titles shuffling forward and backward of, you know, from June and back up to April and back to June again. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, So a lot of last minute adjustments, uh, a lot of it having to do with production the stuff that moved back into April, that was to coincide with what was happening internationally. Um, this is kind of interesting. It, you know, Record Store Day is an international event now. Ireland and Britain and Japan and all kinds of places have Record Store Day now. And they do try to have coinciding release dates so that, you know, the, the rare title that might come out in the U.S. doesn't come out in Britain at a different time so that people are to start ordering them from across the seas you know, before that's released in their country. So uh, they coordinate that pretty carefully. Well, it was a good one here at our store and uh, we're looking forward to a a fun one in June as well. I'm not sure, I'm not certain how big it's going to be on our our part, whether or not we're going to have a line again, but I guess that'll see what happens when we get the fill of the releases. Sure. It's about a third as many titles, but there are some pretty big titles in the, in the group. So uh, I expect there'll be some people definitely waiting for these titles, some of them. Now, with the, when I said the fill, that basically means how many copies stores like ours get versus how many we had requested. And I think we did pretty good uh, from our standpoint. We did pretty good on that uh, for the April one. Is that uh, kind of your feeling from across the board? Did most of the stores get what they were looking for with the exception of that one seven inch, which we won't talk about? Let's not talk about that one, but yeah. You're exactly right. They mostly did, um, and people were pretty happy with with what they got. And then, um, as, as you mentioned, I think at the Wasteland, things sold pretty well uh, for, to the end customers. So we had a lot of orders after Record Store Day for things that we still had a few of that uh, people felt like they had still had customers for, or maybe they just thought, "Hey, I want to stock." you know, that, uh, that title all year round. So. Uh, and I picked up great. a few things in that, in that respect as well. So it was good to have, and including a few things that we didn't get the first time around, which was really cool to see that there were some left. Yeah. That's a strange thing. It can happen though, particularly there's sort of all sorts of vagaries about when things arrive and, and we get not as much as we expect the first time it gets allocated and then more show up, you know, it just happens. So uh, it's a, <laughs> it's organized chaos, the record store that. Well, let's get on to other matters at hand, and that is our weekly check of the highlights of the new releases coming out, hopefully to independent record stores. I know that there were some delays and some oddness. I did notice that one of the titles, the one from the Black Crows especially, is coming uh, in a separate shipment, which means that it probably got to you guys a little late, but I'm appreciative that it's on its way. It did. Uh, we start with that one. That's an all-new collection of covers. It's called 1972. I guess the songs are from 1972. I, I couldn't <laughs> find it exactly where, but it's, you know, people you would recognize the Stones and Bowie, T-Rex and the Temptations and stuff like that. So uh, that should be a fun one for a Black Crows fan. Um, 
There's also a brand new uh, record from Arcade Fire. It's been a minute, and they have a brand new album. Uh, and this one's called We, W-E. Uh, the, uh, there's an indie version that's on white vinyl. That's uh, at the Wasteland. And uh, let's see, what else is new? Tom Morello, uh, third in a series of Atlas-themed uh, titles, but they're different. It's a different record. This one's called The Atlas Underground Flood. That's on blue vinyl. Uh, Graham Nash of Crosby, Stills, Nash fame and, and other places, uh, Hollies and so forth. Uh, he has a new live album, and it's uh, from two of his classic, it's uh, recordings of two of his classic records, uh, Songs for Beginners and Wild Tales, uh, performed live. That's new. Uh, and let's see some fine reissues, the Daft Punk uh, homework record available on vinyl been around, out for a while. Uh, Def Leppard Pyromania on I saw that. Yeah, that one was ripe for a reissue, I think. It was overdue, I think. People were waiting on that. Uh, Eddie Vedder's ukulele songs is, uh, is available on vinyl. I think we're still expecting his most recent one later this summer to be put out on vinyl, but this one is, uh, is available now. Uh, it takes a while to press them. So, uh, and Osaka Ox- 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 Pop Star. Uh, has a uh, version of their ear candy record in uh, limited edition candy swirl bite vinyl uh, with an MP3 card and uh, a 24 page digital comic book. And that's kind of an interesting one. This one's got some punk cred. I was looking at that. It's coming from Misfits Records. And uh, John Caffaro is involved in this. Misfits and Ramon's collaborator. He's been on there. So that that could be a fun one. And it yeah. looks like a fun package. Yeah, it does. It did a terrific job putting the, the, together that one. And uh, last but not least, something from way back, it's Marty Robbins sings gunfighter ballads and trail songs. That's on clear vinyl. That's uh, from uh, way back. What the? 50s, it is. I 40s? like seeing that pop up from time to time. I mean, that's that's always a good one. It's got a lot of great tunes on it. And I know that we don't see the originals of that as often as I'd like, but when we do, man, they're up there a little bit. Value-wise. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It is a classic. If you if you like cowboy songs, man, that yep. is quite frankly possibly the best <laughs> record ever made. Such a sad song. El Paso is such a sad song, too. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Well, thank you, Ken. And uh, that should cover it. Uh, we'll hopefully get a chance to talk next week again, rather uh, dependent upon whether or not uh, you guys get swamped again with the Record Store Day Part 2. I don't we'll just call it the June drop coming up soon. You drop soon, but uh, uh, those uh, records won't start arriving for a few weeks. So hopefully we'll be able to talk next week. Got some time. Ken Norton from Ingram Entertainment. As always, thanks, Ken, for being here. And that's our check on the highlights of this week's new releases. Thanks again. Awesome. Thank you. So I've got a little bit of a problem here at the store. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a fun problem to have, but a problem nonetheless. A little while back, we got a copy of John Lee Hooker's Traveling In to the store. Not just any copy, this is a sealed copy. And not only is it just a sealed copy, it's an absolutely beautiful looking cover on this sealed copy. This was taken very, very well care of. So here's the problem. In going through Discogs, we are unable to specifically identify the pressing of this without looking at the labels. For all it's worth, Discogs is great, but you have to be able to see the labels. And that doesn't help, especially when it comes to rare first pressings. And in this case, a rare 1960 mono version or possibly a later unknown year reissue. I'd like to mention that in all my years collecting and in the five years that we've been running the store, that I have never seen a first pressing, if this is indeed a first pressing, in such beautiful condition. The corners are as crisp as can be, the seal is intact, and there is no age discoloration or watermarking anywhere on this. That's what's so infuriating about this, is the fact that if this is a first pressing, it's almost a miracle that it made it this long in this condition. We even asked a couple of our more knowledgeable customers with their thoughts on this, and they are of the same opinion. This could very well be, but given the beautiful shape that it's in, it might not be. So therein lies our problem. Let's go through Discogs to check to see if we can identify specifically which one this is. 
So I've already done a search in Discogs and identified the pressing that I think this is, but we'll go through that process again to see if we are correct. We know it's vinyl and we know it's VJ. We're going to assume that it's a US copy, but this is where it gets tricky. There are two copies in the first press from 1960, one from 65, one from 68, and then a reissue from 2000. Now using the new Discog search system, we can actually just look at the images of this and given that the album is sealed, we'll have to do our best just to narrow it down. So we'll start with the 1960 copies first. There are only two of them. One labeled as a repress, the other as an original mono. Now, this one is labeled LP1023 and not LP1023 or VJS as shown on the cover. Not much to go on on this one because there's no more pictures added in, but you can see that the stereo copy does have a stereo print on the front of the cover. Ours does not. Again, this is the one we think it is because everything seems to match the album in hand. What we can't look at, however, are the labels. Now, just to be safe, let's go back out and look at the represses. From 1965, it's another mono repress, but the cover, and again, this could be an error on the submitter's part in Discogs, shows that there is a stereo image up top there, and there's no back cover to compare it to. So then let's go to 1968, and then we'll check that and look at the unknowns. The 1968 is also labeled LP1023, but in looking at that, it has the stereo logo on the front cover. So that leaves us with the unknown copies, and since there's only nine, it's not too tough to go through there. So let's scroll down and look at the unknown year reissues, just to be safe. Here is an unknown VJ, which this one could possibly be, given that the back cover and the front cover match. The next is a mono reissue, of which the covers match as well. The third, another unknown year, but this has the stereo, so we'll ignore that. And then another stereo reissue as well. So what we've come down to is, is that our copy is either this reissue, this reissue from an unknown year, or the original mono copy. Again, the covers look like they match all the way through. So now the big question is the valuation of this copy. If we're going to assume that this is a first pressing mono, we can go in and look and see that its prices range from 70 to 150, assuming that that $150 mark is the high end. We can look at the copies for sale to see if there are any in mint condition. There are none. The only near mint one is asking $172 and it's coming from overseas. We can look also at the sales history to see if a mint copy had ever sold in there in the last 10. And by the looks of it, no, the nearest being near mint copies of the original pressing going for 150 and another near mint going for 150. So you see a little bit of the conundrum that we face. If this truly is a sealed first pressing, opening it up to identify it could very well devalue it. However, if we leave it sealed, we'll never know for sure what copy it is. Now I know the third possibility is, is unsealing it just to verify the pressing and then still labeling it as a mint copy, but what's the fun in that? Curious to see what you think. Please let us know in the comments below whether or not you think we should open this up to positively identify the specific pressing or if we should just roll the dice and leave it sealed and see what our customers think. Very curious to know what you think. Again, please let me know in the comments below and we'll let you know what we decide down the line. Spin me right round, baby, right round, like a record, baby, round, 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 round. You spin me right round, baby, right round, like a record, baby, round, 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 round. Thanks for watching The Record Show. If you haven't done so yet, please make sure to subscribe to the Radio Wasteland Records YouTube channel. And be sure to hit that notifications bell so you'll be alerted every time we upload new content. <laughs>